Hi everybody, Father Bill Holtzinger here, and this is your Friday Reflection. Uh, well, as we approach November, we're getting into what we'll call a unofficial liturgical season where we really focus on those who have passed away. I say that because um, we're still in ordinary time, officially, all the way through November until the very end, then we move into Advent, but it is a common tradition in lots of parishes to pray for their loved ones who have passed away. Now, this is a very Catholic thing to do. You won't hear this from their Protestant brothers and sisters. And the question becomes, why is that? So I'd like to offer you a biblical response to why that is the case. So I'm using my New American Bible, and it's important that I do that as a Catholic Bible. If I use, the, say, the excellent New International Version, which is a very common uh, translation for uh, Protestant Christians, or maybe the RSV, but the version for Protestants, there are books taken out. And one of those books is, well, there's actually many of them, but seven of them. Uh, one that's important regarding this, because one will say, well, this is not biblical. Why would we pray for the dead? That if they have expressed their faith in Jesus, they are assured salvation. I'm like, well, uh, we, that's up to God, of course. And we also have to realize that we don't know their faith, only God does. And just because someone says, Lord, Lord, does not mean that they actually mean it in their life. So we leave it up to God, and we have hope for their salvation. But, can, but then that means from this world to the next world, I suppose they die with sin on their hearts. And I had a friend who was uh, a minister, and we were at a Sherry's restaurant one time. And he asked, well, did, do you guys still believe in purgatory? And I said, well, last time we voted, and of course I'm being silly, uh, we didn't vote on this. The church has always reflected on what is it that happens to someone after they leave this world and they have sin on their souls? But yet God has chosen them to be with them, to be saved by him. And that would be what we call purgatory. So this event occurs where, and, and Catholics will also think about it as time and space, where it's a hard one to kind of grapple with when we're considering outside of this existence, time and space don't make a lot of sense. Like how long is heaven and where is it, right? So purgatory, people often reflect as a place and a time. I think it'd be better to call it an experience. An experience of being washed of the sins or purged of the sins that we have when we die. So for example, let's suppose I am alcoholic and I'm drinking, but I love Jesus. I have this thing that causes me to be drunken and that's a sin and I'm dying in that state. Well, <clears throat> I can't be in heaven and be perfect in heaven until that is taken care of and God does that. We call that purgatory, the process of pulling that out. Another way of looking at it, when I talked to my friend, I said, well, imagine that you and I, who are both Christians of different traditions, we're sitting here eating our pie at a Sherry's restaurant and a, a meteor hit, and it's like the size of a basketball. That would take out the block, that would take out half of a city, possibly. Anyhow, you know, we'd be dead instantly, regardless. What happens to us? How is it we come from here to there? And he says, well, we're washed by the blood of the lamb. I'm like, amen, brother, that is exactly the case. I believe that. In other words, an event happens that Jesus does. It is biblical, but the thing about being biblical is that you have to have the full text of the Old Testament, the text that Jesus would have had. And those seven of those books have been pulled out. And so one of those is Maccabees. And I'd like to read for you. This is um, 2 Maccabees chapter 13. And I'll start at verses 38 and go to 46. And we read this. Now, by the way, I should give a, uh, a little backup here. So a guy named Judas Maccabeus, he's battling the Romans. Uh, and so this is the Maccabean War that is very historical. Our Jewish brothers and sisters speak about the Maccabean War. And so this is an event of the Maccabean War. Judas rallied his army and went to the city of Adullam. As the week was ending, they purified themselves according to the custom and kept the Sabbath there. On the following day, since the task had now become urgent, Judas and his men went to gather up the bodies of the slain and bury them, in, bury them with their kinsmen in their ancestral tombs. So, okay, that's great. Under the tunic of each of the dead, they found amulets sacred to the idols of Jamnia, which the law forbids Jews to wear. So this is an idolatry issue, right? So it was clear to all that this was why these men had been slain. They all therefore praised the ways of the Lord, the just judge who brings to light the things that are hidden. 
Turning to supplication, they prayed that the sinful deed might be fully blotted out. The noble Judas warned the soldiers to keep themselves free from sin, for they had seen with their own eyes what had happened because of the sin of those who had fallen. And here's the kicker. Verse 43. He then took up a collection among all the soldiers amounting to 2,000 silver drachmas, which he sent to Jerusalem to provide for an expiatory sacrifice. In doing this, he acted in a very excellent and noble way, inasmuch as he had the resurrection of the dead in view. For if he had not, for if he were not expecting the fallen to rise again, it would have been useless and foolish to pray for them in death. But if he did this with a view to the splendid reward that, awa that awaits those who had gone to rest in godliness, it was a holy and pious thought. Thus, he made atonement for the dead that they might be freed from this sin. So we have in the scriptures, this is the idea of praying for the dead is biblical. They're praying for the dead, asking God to rescue them from their sins. And of course, in the time of uh, the temple here, we have in time of the Maccabean War, there was this belief, and it was something that gradually kind of became part of the belief of Jews, that there was a resurrection. Not we just died and we were in Sheol, and that's it, after death. But after death, instead, that there would be a resurrection. And he actually then paid for an expiatory sacrifice. In other words, a sacrifice to be done at the temple with prayer that these men would be saved and given the resurrection of what would be, you would say, and Jesus was of this, of course, uh, sense that we will die and have a resurrected body after death. So there's life after death. So that's, this is what uh, we're doing when we as Catholics are praying. We're praying for those who are, who are dead. We're not doing necromancy, but we're actually asking God to save them, to help heal them as they're walking through whatever this is, and I use that in a metaphorical way, walking through purgatory, we accompany them with our prayers. Now imagine, another analogy. So imagine I need to get from one point to another, and it's a very difficult path. In fact, it's treacherous, or it's cold, or whatever you might come up with. It's nice to have someone along with me. I will get there, but it's difficult, and it's nice to have a companion on the journey. And that's what our prayers are doing. We're asking God to save this person, but we're also companioning this person on their journey to heaven. So now they are in purgatory. They will then be assured heaven at the end. Again, I remember my language is uh, wrought with time and space, which is problematic, but if I'm praying for them, I'm asking God to help them. Not to worry that they won't be saved, but I have hope that they'll be saved, and I'm going to assume they're in purgatory. Now, if someone has been judged by God, to go to hell, remember there's the separating of the sheep and the goats, there's no prayer that can save them. We have chosen a life of separation between, from God, and God in His justice gives us that separation from Him, and that is what is hell. So during this time, and it starts with the very beginning of November, right? We, All Saints Day. Well, we didn't even go the day before, Halloween. The Eve of All Saints Day, the, uh, the Hallow's Eve, the Eve of those who are hallowed, those are saints. Uh, we may then, during that time, of course, in our culture, enjoy trick-or-treating, but it's really the church's evening celebration. Like we have Christmas Eve, the night before Christmas Day. This is a celebration, and we could have Mass on that evening if we wished. A lot of churches don't because the, our culture has Halloween, and so that would be likely what people are engaged in. And then the next day is a holy day of obligation for us Catholics, All Saints Day. And we'll have, as we normally will, our morning mass, and it's 8.15. We'll have our 2.05, that'll be our school mass. And then we'll have our 7 p.m. mass, which will be for all those folks who are working. And the nice thing about the 7 p.m. mass, it's gonna be different because it's dark outside. We're gonna do a contemplative approach to this. In other words, we'll have the lights dimmed. We have a lot of candles put out. You'll see the banners from uh, those who have passed on, the list of all those who have passed on the last year. And the music will be more subdued. I will pray the prayers uh, more slowly. And it'll just be a more, you could say calm. It won't be boisterous. It'll be more quiet. And there'll be large blocks of silence between things. 
So I want to encourage you to consider coming to Mass. Choose which one it is. If you're coming to Holy Trinity, you have the schedule. I'll put it up here again if I said it wrong. But come, celebrate those people who are in heaven. Now, by the way, the next day, we are celebrating and praying for specifically those who are in the process that have died that we don't know who are in heaven yet. But this All Saints Day, we praise God for those who is given heaven. All those who are not just uh, have died, but those who are saints in heaven that are not the named, that we don't know the names. So we have all these saints like Saint Ignatius, Saint Catherine of Siena. All these people we have are saints with a capital S in heaven. But maybe it's like my mom. Maybe she's in heaven. She would be a saint. As I'm celebrating this day of all saints, I'm mindful of those who are in heaven. And I have hope that that's her. So I want to encourage you also to come to a good, a holy, excuse me, All Souls Day. I'm going to be wearing a black vestment. It's about the only time I do to signify that we're praying for those who have been darkened by death and are hopefully walking to the light. And that's our job. I believe we have actually have a guest coming on All Souls Day morning. I believe it's a, a visiting bishop from out of our country, and he'll be con celebrating with me. I don't know him, uh, and so I don't know his name yet, but uh, we've been asked to, if it would be possible. I'm like, great, he's got to do some paperwork, and then he'll be able to be with us. I hope to see you this weekend at Mass. Father Anthony is preaching. Um, I will be helping out. <laughs> And um, I want to ask you to pray for him as he prepares for his homily, as I ask you when I'm ready for my, or getting ready for my homily as well. And so I'll see you this weekend, and have a great Halloween, and a wonderful All Saints Day. Bye-bye.